much, and I appreciate that you took the time and stayed to this very last minute for this last presentation of the day when Manoj asked me, you know, can you give a short introduction to predictive modeling at Informs? You know, I said, oh, I'm sure, I'm more than happy to do that. How much time do I have? And he said, 30 minutes, and I thought, wow. It's going to be quite an experience. And he said, you know, never mind, you can talk about exploratory analysis tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So that's another 30 minutes, right? So I believe, you know, having the last session today and the first one tomorrow, on, on average, I'm doing okay. <laughs> so I was just driving down from Raleigh, where I'm living now. I just relocated to the US six months ago from Germany. So when I asked my colleagues, what's the best way of going from Raleigh to Charlotte? You know, Manoj said, it's a short trip, right? It's only three hours by car. And so, all right, I'll, I'll try that. I give it a try, and I drove down I-40, and I drove down I-85, I believe it is. And I was watching the sky, and all of a sudden, there was it, right? A picture, a face in the sky. So what happened then? I took a photograph. No, I'm just making this up, of course, right? <laughs> The reason why I'm bringing this up is that, you know, my talk will be about predictive analytics. And um, before I delve into that, uh, I thought I, I used the whole theme of pattern recognition in the area of predictive analytics. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that we have a common understanding that, you know, we humans, we are pretty good in detecting patterns, especially images, right? So if I look around in the crowd, I can immediately recognize my colleagues, right? And those of you who have never seen before, I'm just filtering out, right? But because of that, we also have a tendency to see patterns where there are no patterns, right? So especially if you watch the sky and you see pictures in the sky, I can ensure you there are no faces in the sky, right? So there's even a word for that. Apophenia, which I learned only recently. It's a, a topic of research and it basically is about you know seeing meaningful patterns in random data. Okay. So having that point made, let's go further to the topic of pattern detection. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up also is I recently read this book about um, service-oriented oriented architectures, and uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about the information architect. And one of the interesting quotes uh, in this book was that, you know, this guy, Werman, he said, you know, the information architect is the one who organizes the patterns inherent in data. And I thought, well, that's me, right? Because I've been with SAS now for more than 10 years, uh, mainly focusing on data mining and forecasting. And what I do, actually, is finding patterns in data to use them to extrapolate them and predict the future. And that's what I'm doing now at the headquarters in this new team in R&D, which is called the Advanced Analytics Services and Optimization, where we are basically helping customers to build you know, predictive application and optimization solutions. So what are the typical questions we are running into? I think this morning we had this discussion whether you know our customers would understand if we say something like linear programming or nonlinear programming, and would they care after all? And most of the time they wouldn't, right? So what they are really interested in are business questions. Like for example, we, we saw in this presentation very nice present, uh, examples of you know how do we deal with the fact that you know if customers want to churn or not, or if you have time series data, the question might be, you know, which of these patterns in the time series indicate a problem? You talked about predictive maintenance, right? So that's exactly an example for that. Also, questions which come to mind are, you know, what is the best investment strategy? Social media being very, you know, popular these days, right? So people look at these network data and then they try to figure out, okay, who are, you know, maybe the people who own a certain sub-network? So if you convince them, they will convince people in their sub-network. Or maybe there are fraud rings in the network, right? So if there's fraud happening, it might be the same people over and over again. 
An area where I'm very familiar with is the area of uh, forecasting. So here we deal with the question of, for example, how much inventory do we need, right? And of course, I will also talk a little bit about text analytics. We heard about that so much now, so I thought I'd make this a little bit more real, and I'll show you some examples how this is actually done in some of our projects. But before I do that, I thought, well, let's come up with yet another definition of business analytics. And in my opinion, you know, business analytics is not so much about which technique you are using, what kind of methodology you are applying, it's more about the process you are following. So every time you, you start a predictive analytics or optimization project or any other project which involves some modeling, it's not so much the modeling which matters in my opinion. It's more like how do you organize the process of implementing the solution. So all of a sudden data preparation and data exploration become as important as the actual modeling. And then what do you do with the models, right? How do you apply the models in real life becomes a very important question. How do you deploy the models? How do you monitor the models over time? How do you decide whether the model is still valid or not? becomes a very important question. So once again, I believe business analytics can be considered as this process. And today in this presentation, I would like to focus on modeling only. But of course, I would like you to remember that actually I'm talking about the whole process. Tomorrow morning, we will talk about data exploration. Maybe. So this is usually the data which I find when I have to do predictive modeling exercises. I refer to this as cross-sectional data. And what I mean by that is actually, you have this flat table denormalized. And that's most of the time already a challenge because the data wasn't stored for any analytical purposes at all. Right, so the first thing we need to do is to look at, you know, DB2 tables, for example. They are highly normalized, so you need to combine the data again, and you need to flatten them out, you know. And then you end up with this table, where, for example, in the, uh, in the area of customer analytics, one customer is described by one row in the table, okay? And then you have all this customer information, and you try to make sense out of this. Now, depending on your modeling exercise, let's say we want to model fraud, the actual question becomes, is the customer fraudulent or not, right? In the area of predictive analytics, we refer to this as supervised modeling, which means we do have historic information about customers, whether they were fraudulent or not, right? And that's our target variable. And once we have a target, we can start and go ahead and build predictive models, trying to identify the target. So which techniques are commonly used? Well, good old regression analysis, of course. And many people out there are still using very successfully uh, traditional regression techniques, just like re uh, log logistic regression. But there are also now many, many more predictive modeling techniques, such as decision trees. And a decision tree, um, it's not the decision tree from optimization where you basically have you know, probabilities along a decision tree. It's basically also a predictive modeling technique which allows you to segment your data. Okay? And there are different ways like shape or classification and regression trees. It's basically a nice way to segment your data or classify, I should say. Neural networks, this has been an area which there, there was a lot of excitement because people thought, you know, oh, artificial intelligence, and finally we can get rid of all these statisticians who only cost a lot of money, you know. But in reality, what a neural network actually is, is just another way of doing regression analysis, right? And you are basically applying optimization techniques to fine tune the parameters of a neural network. And I could go on and on and on. There are, you know, support vector machines. There are new techniques which try to combine traditional techniques, right? Another one which is fairly interesting and fairly new is the lift modeling. So you heard about um, the area of um, identifying customers who will respond to your marketing activities, right? So if you basically apply a regression model, you will basically distinguish between those who respond and those who don't respond. But now in, in the area or in the segment of your responders, there will be people who would have responded anyway, right? Whether you sent them something or not, so they would have bought anyway. 
what you are much more interested in is the segment or the sub-segment of the responders which will buy something because of your marketing activity. And this is what lift models actually do. So they basically focus more on you know, the segment of the responders which will add benefit to our overall results. So which one is best? Well, who knows, right? It's basically up to the data which you have at hand, right? So sometimes the, classic, uh, the decision trees will outperform regression. Sometimes neural networks will outperform decision trees, right? It depends on the data which you have at hand. In theory, all of these techniques are so-called general approximators, right? So if you would have only regression, you would be able to achieve similar results like for all other techniques. But you might not be able to come up with a model because you, you can't really define the model, right? So in reality, what's happening with software which we as a vendor provide, but others like IBM as well, of course, is you, you model many different type of models, right? And then you use some holdout sample to decide which is the model which performs best on my data, okay? So what is the typical goal of such exercise? Well, like I said, we typically have in these kind of instances a binary target, yes, no, fraud, no fraud, you know, responder, non-responder. And in a simple two-dimensional example, you would try to figure out, okay, if the blues are the, the re responders and the red points are the non-responders, how can I discriminate the data in a way that if a new customer arrives, I can immediately decide, right, based on these attributes, the likelihood of this person being a responder is X, okay? And once you have that information, you can feed this into optimization algorithms, such as marketing optimization, where you can basically then take advantage of these findings to figure out, well, which channel should I use, right, and which offer should I use for a certain type of customer. In reality, things are much more complex, and there's no need to say that, that it's multiple dimensions we have to consider. But I think this example already illustrates the complexity, and once again, the whole notion of using training data to adjust your estimates and then having a kind of you know, independent sample which you are using your results to assess your results on the fly is very commonplace in predictive modeling these days. Okay. So let me give you some examples of companies who are applying these kind of techniques in reality. HSBC is one of the largest banks, I believe, worldwide. I'm not sure whether they're really um, you know, popular in the US, but uh, I can tell you that in Europe and Asia Pacific, they are a, a huge bank, right? I believe HSBC stands for Hong Kong, Shanghai Banking Corporation, so they started really there, and you know, they're growing now across the world. And what they do is something which is actually pretty cool, right? So they implemented these kind of fraud detection models, right? So a modeler or a team of modelers, let's say, has come up with a, with a formula which allows you to decide if a customer is you know, using their credit card in a store or, an, or an ATM machine, you want to figure out, well, is this transaction fraudulent or not? Now, if you are standing in front of an ATM machine and you put in your uh, credit card, you don't want to wait until the analyst says, all right, go ahead, right? This guy is non-fraudulent. So this needs to be automated, right? So the decision needs to be made in a split second. And this is how we distinguish in predictive modeling between the area of the model building, this is what I believe the people in this room would do, and then the application of the model, which is sometimes called scoring. Right? And scoring at the end of the day is nothing else but having a hard-coded model. All the estimates are fixed. You basically have your formula. You know, somebody swipes the card, and then the model tells you fraudulent. Right? And that's why they can implement such systems in almost real time. Another area which is kind of related, 
And that's an area which I had to get used to in the US, is the whole fact that you are handing out this coupons all the time, right? In <coughs> Europe, we don't do this. But uh, here it's quite interesting if you go to, and I don't have to explain this to you, of course, but if you go to a retailer and you basically hand in your customer loyalty card or whatever, they will print out some coupons for you for the next purchase you will make, right? And Catalina Marketing is a, is a provider for these kind of uh, techniques, uh, for this kind of technology. And they are using SaaS for the similar kind of purpose. So on the fly, they will try to analyze your market basket Okay, and then figure out, okay, what is a coupon which this customer should receive? Because it would be kind of annoying, right, if I just bought coffee and you give me a, a, a coupon for coffee as well, telling me that now the price is 30% reduced, right, isn't it? So probably that's not the smartest decision to make, okay? And my last example is uh, in the area of predictive modeling. Um, it's similar to what BMW does. Um, in this case, it's Sub-Zero, they build refrigerators, and we were helping them to figure out, okay, how can you implement a predictive modeling environment to figure out, okay, how many resources are required to maintain or to do maintenance for your refrigerators. Let me talk about forecasting as well. And the main difference, in my opinion, between predictive modeling and forecasting is the data. Right? So the data you have at hand looks different. You remember the cross-sectional data? We had one row per customer. Now in time series, it's different. You are monitoring one customer over time, and that's why your data looks different. Right? It's usually much longer data sets you have at hand, and now you're trying to figure out, well, is there so-called autocorrelation in the data? Right? Does the data correlate with itself over time? And this kind of information you are using to predict the future, okay? So there are, again, many, many different techniques available, ranging from exponential smoothing models, which basically will tell you uh, on which level should we start our prediction, is there trend in the data upwards or downwards, any seasonality you can detect, or more advanced models like ARIMA or ARIMAX models, unobserved component models, which are basically based on the ideas of autocorrelation and regression techniques. Now sometimes, you, or very often, you will face the fact that you would love to have sufficient data, but in fact, if you are working with retail, for example, they will tell you 80% of our products are so-called slow movers. So we are selling them once a month, right? So how does your time series look like? Well, if you monitor the time series on monthly data, it will be zero, 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 demand 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So what is the best forecast for such data? Well, it's zero, right? But the retailer will laugh at you if you say, well, I predicted for all of your slow-moving items that you will have no demand in the next months, right? So you need to come up with some more, you know, appropriate methods, and Crossman's method is one of which, which is designed to handle this kind of slow-moving uh, forecasting challenges. What I usually recommend to my clients when we do these kind of exercises is to start off with something, right? And this something is usually a naive model. What do I mean by that? It, well, we heard, I believe, this morning that a lot of customers or people out there who are doing forecasting use last year's number to use it as a prediction for this year or this year's numbers to use it as a prediction for next year. Well, in statistical terms, we call this a random model, right? So we basically use one point to predict the future, okay? Now, you might say, well, it's kind of pointless to do this, but in reality, if your data is very volatile, random walk can do a pretty good job, right? So beating a random walk model can be challenging if you have a lot of noise in your original data, okay? So what I recommend usually in these kind of exercises is let's start with a random walk as your baseline and then everything we do needs to be measured against the random walk model. Okay, if we can't beat the random walk model, well, why did we bother with you know complex models like unobserved components in the first place? Right? Let's focus on the data where this type of technique makes sense. In forecasting, we find now more frequently also papers out there which suggest that instead of looking just at one technique, 
you should combine different techniques. So you can use averaging, you know, restricted d squares, and so on and so on. So that's an area which is evolving and which is promising, just like the ensemble models in data mining. Once again, I have my uh, typical goal illustration slide. So what you see on the left-hand side is the historic data. That's the dark points, right? And then you see the blue line, which is basically your predictive model, your forecasting model. So now you can see how the forecasting model is trying to find a pattern in the data. Okay. So at the end of the day, all these forecasting techniques trying to put weights on the historic data in order to come up with a prediction into the future. Okay? So what we are really, really interested in is not so much how much we, how good we are fitting the historic data. That's not much of an issue in forecasting. What we are really interested in is how well are we predicting the future. So once again, the whole idea of using holdout samples comes to play. So you leave aside some of your data you predict and then you try to figure out, well, how well does my forecasting model predict the future by looking at this holdout sample? To me, and that's sometimes a bit tricky to explain to the business users, a forecast is not just a number, right? A forecast is a prediction with a prediction confidence interval. So you basically say, you know, there's some uncertainty in your data, so the best thing I can tell you is that the forecast is ranging somehow between 90 and 110. And then it's up to the business to make a decision what is important for them. So for example, we recently worked with a bank on optimizing um, ATM machines in Singapore. And they told us, you know, to us it's much more important that we don't run out of cash rather than having too much cash in the ATM machine. So what does this mean for the forecast? Well, we need to bias towards the upper confidence limit, right? Because, you know, the impact of having, you know, a, a forecast which is biased towards um, the upper prediction limit is exactly what the customer was asking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, you still with me? Excellent. Some examples, once again, Waitrose, that's a, a retail chain in the UK. They are using SAS to come up with predictions for all their products and all their stores. And that's typically the type of engagement I'm involved with, because here we are talking about true large-scale forecasting. About four million time series they have, okay? So even if you are the best modeler on God's earth, right, you won't have the time to sit down and model all these you know, items individually. So some type of automation is required, right? So usually I use the example of a, of a plane. So if you go on a plane, you will know that there's an autopilot, of course, right? So the autopilot most of the time does a good job. But nevertheless, we are pretty happy that there's a pilot as well, right? <coughs> Just in case something is happening. Same thing for forecasting, right? We automate what can be automated. Right? And at some point in time, if there are items which are really, really important, like in the case of Waitrose, they might be selling plasma TVs, right, which are very expensive, which they don't want to put too much inventory. Um, we basically would sit down and try to model these type of series manually. Okay? Italia, that's uh, the Finnish postal services. Uh, the only reason I added this is basically to show you how businesses and also government organizations are waking up now to the idea that actually that what they should do is predict the future and make their decisions based on future outcome rather than analyzing the past and then say, oh, this didn't work well, right? So we have to adjust this, right? So you see the whole idea of predictive analytics is now becoming more and more part of the mindset of people out there. The last example for forecasting I have is Frontline. They are producing magazines, and the reason why I have put this up is that in you know, uh, operations research, I believe the newspaper problem is a very well-known, studied you know, kind of problem. This is kind of related. The difference is that magazines can be replenished, 
right? So you don't have to be on the spot by the day, right? So if you're running out of a certain magazine, which is a monthly published magazine, you can, you know, send additional copies to the supermarket, right? And this makes it an ideal example for forecasting as well, right? So we basically are helping frontline figure out which magazines to put into the stores of the supermarkets in the UK. With that, I would like to move on to the next area, text analytics. Uh, I think Manoj just mentioned that you know about 80% of the data, or even more, is so-called unstructured data. So us, you know, who deal with modeling, we like to have quantitative data, right? We like to have numbers where we can, you know, apply our algorithms on, right? Here with text data, it's different. So. We believe it says there are two different you know, opportunities for us to analyze this kind of text data. One is the area of content, content categorization. To give you an example for that, if you are basically a news provider, right, and a new, you know, emerging news is coming up, you want to know, well, how do I classify, how do I tag this news on my external website? So if people are looking for it, you want to automatically you know, classify this document. That's the area of content. Text mining is something different. Text mining tries to translate textual data into quantitative data, so from text to numbers. So you can use the numbers then to build better predictive models. So how does that work? You basically look at the unstructured text and then you know you apply techniques like parsing, tagging, which is basically going through the through the text and trying to figure out okay which are the words which are you know very frequently in the text. To me, NLP so far stood for nonlinear programming. For them, it's natural language processing. So we need to be aware that a lot of new acronyms are hitting our space. But at the end of the day, what it means is you're going through this text and you're trying to figure out you know, whether certain terms mean the same thing, okay? And once you have that, you can basically try to come up with something like, you know, vector quantification and these kind of things to figure out, you know, can we translate this information into numbers which then can be used for predictive modeling purposes. So where are we headed now? Um, I believe we heard a lot about big data and I thought, you know, let's make this a bit more real as well. So it's not just a marketing term which is out there and everybody's bragging about how they can handle a lot of data. Uh, I believe big data is not really a new idea, is it, right? I mean, it's basically by the time IBM, Oracle and, you know, the guys announce that they can handle more data in their databases, the analysts get excited and say, well, we want to analyze this, right? So something we've been dealing with for a long time. But what is really new now is that the, the means of storing data has changed dramatically. So we have data sitting in a cloud, right? So there is no such thing as a database. <coughs> Hadoop might be an example for that. Uh, we have machines at our hand which have a lot of stacks, so-called blade servers, right? So we basically fit in you know, additional memory by the time you have money available. Or you have so-called grids, which is basically a network of different computers talking to each other, right? So you can send out jobs to the grid, and then the grid will basically decide how to compute your estimates. And this can happen in parallel now, of course. And this is what Manoj has alluded to, that this will, of course, change the way we compute our models. Because all of a sudden, we need to decide, well, which of our tasks in the model development can run in parallel, and where are the bottlenecks, right? So if you have a, a grid computing environment, and you have you know, one node which takes really long, you know, the whole purpose of the grid is gone, right? Because you have to wait until this one node is finishing, okay? And that's part of the challenges we are now uh, facing. So at SARS, I think we decided to invest a lot of research money into redesigning most of our algorithms to run in parallel, right? And this is a huge initiative. So this is what we mean when we say big data analytics. 
So basically three areas. Like I said, grid computing, how do you take advantage of you know, a computing network? You know, many computers connected together. Also the whole area of in-database analytics. So rather than moving the data to the analytical environment, you basically move analytical intelligence into the databases. So this is something IT usually likes a lot, right? Because they can get, well, what's the word, anal? I'm sorry. <laughs> so they can be very, you know, strange when it comes to moving of data, right? So the idea is, instead of saying we need to duplicate your data, we move analytical capabilities into the database. And then, like I said, memory is, you know, available at our hands. The machines are becoming more and more powerful. So the whole idea of in-memory analytics is evolving. So that's basically, and that's my marketing slide. I think I, I had to add one, right, didn't I? So SaaS is providing, you know, capabilities in all of this, right? So I think the true advantage of our software is not so much whether we have the fastest, you know, solver in linear programming, or whether we have the most advanced forecasting technique, or whether we have, you know, done a lot of research in how to optimize neural networks, right? It's the fact that you can do all of this in one environment, which is really something where we believe we excel over competition. And not only that, the fact that we can also integrate, if you remember my process flow, we can integrate the data management steps and also the information distribution steps into one common environment, which we call the business analytics framework, is something which is very compelling to our client base. With that, I'll let you go for tonight, and I was hoping that you might take the time and see me again tomorrow at 8. So I